game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Hi, everyone. This is Raghu Marcus and another edition of Ramdas Here and Now. And uh, I just want to prompt you all out there with a couple of things that are important to us in the podcast network. And uh, one of them, of course, is our ongoing wonderful sponsors, 1440 and... Uh, We've been talking to them for an awful long time just because what they do is so interlaced with who we are. It's quite wonderful. And uh, to prove that point, I'm going to tell you about a wonderful weekend retreat at the end of January in our upcoming year, 2020. And it's with Sharon and Omid Safi both of whom have wonderful podcasts on BeHereNowNetwork.com that you should check out. And this is called Path of the Courageous Heart. And if you've not been to the campus of 1440, uh, please visit 1440.org and check it out because it's just a beautiful campus near Santa Cruz. 1440 Multiversity. And also, we have a new supporter and somebody who I actually had a a conversation with myself who started what's called Follow Your Heart. It's a wonderful company that has a product called Veginase that I am absolutely sure that many of you know about. I have been using this egg-free mayonnaise forever, and it is not only, uh, not only is it great for you, it tastes great, okay? I use it for everything. I, I told them, I, I, I can't even tell people enough <laughs> what, what this means to me in terms of day-to-day. I don't think uh, week-to-week that I've used any other uh, food product like that uh, as consistently. So... Uh, Follow Your Heart. This podcast is also, as uh, we have our wonderful friends, 1440 Multiversity, this is Follow Your Heart. And uh, I I want to really, uh, they also have a full line of dairy-free cheeses. And uh, and they're, you know, a leader in plant-based food. So go to followyourheart.com and check them out, okay? Uh, and by the way, everybody out there, uh, of course, everything that we do under Love Serve Remember Foundation, Ramdas.org, be here now, network.com, and of course, our new movie that's been out this uh, fall into the late part of the year, 2019, Becoming Nobody. So go to becomingnobody.com and uh, check that out as well, because the, oh yeah, I'm glad I thought of this. There will be a release in January of a DVD or download. So finally, anybody who wants to can get to see this quite wonderful film. Okay, here's the talk by Ram Dass. It's and by the, I want to dedicate this podcast to my good friend Duncan Trussell. Duncan. Please do listen to this podcast, and he'll know what I'm talking about, and uh, we'll have a conversation with him on mind rolling about this, okay? Astral Fun and Games, Part 1, okay? That's the title. Uh, So this starts out with a famous, so 
Ramdas starts out talking about miracles. Maharaji, Nimkaroli Baba miracles. And one famous one is Maharaji goes to, a, um, no, I'm not going to tell the story, but it is so, uh, it is so out there that anybody can go, this is not possible. This, this can't be. But of course, those of us that were with Maharaji and were party to all of this kind of thing know that anything is possible. It's all possible with anything. <laughs> So uh, Ramdas tells this story, okay, and I won't get into it except that um, it's pretty fantastical, and and he talks about well, what's the value of a story like that, which is kind of you know the inside joke with Duncan, who was like, what what is what is, yeah miracles are miracles. What is what is the value of it? Is it titillation, um, or or is it just just because it's converting the skeptic, and we get. When we get lost, you know, in in life, and we are completely without any recompense whatsoever, that there is a way to get out of this mess. Yeah, a miracle might appear. You know, and it happens to people, and not just. I mean, Maharaji is one example because that's who we know, and he was. He is, <laughs> not a was, it's an is, as many people experience him uh, in that same body with that same blanket. Not the ones like us that saw him back in the day, but certainly people that are connected in the same way that we are with this being, which is in itself miraculous, uh, absolutely uh, see him many, many times. I see this all the time. We just did a retreat and we talked about, I talked about this directly with Lama Surya Das. He seems to be making lots of appearances to people. So the body, not body, you don't need a body, you don't need a guru in a body, uh, all of it is like, you know, who really knows what's going on? Um, so, but miracles touch, uh, Ramdas says, miracles touch you, and, and, you know, touch you in a way that's beyond mine. And they start an opening, uh, and it's, it's trust, and that becomes a little bit of faith. And um, and it it really works even more because many people can do you know that have powers can they're not necessarily realized beings or what we call in India or what we were told these kind of beings like Neem Karoli Baba are siddhas that they're they're not living any subject object object yet they're relating in a human body so it's it's a, an unusual state but. Uh, the more pure the being is that actually does these miracles. And as I said, many beings can do it. They don't necessarily, the powers are available to beings as pretty much we all know because we see it in, in our world. Uh, uh, social, you know, social interactions that we have, political, there are people who have powers. You know, they have power of a silver tongue. So, but the more pure that a being is, then the more effect this has to open up our more, call it our spiritual natures. Um, uh, miracles are exquisite because your mind gets undercut. There's no rational way to explain them. So, so it's very purposeful that uh, this all happened to us in particular with Ramdas. Um, there's a great story, by the way, here of, of Ramdas with Mayor Baba. Um, it's it's a very famous uh, story related to the psychedelics that Mayor Baba told Ramdas it was okay to take in a letter, three times, but that was it. But then they got really uptight. He got uptight. Uh, there was a whole scene around psychedelics with Mayor Baba, who who basically uh, told him that you 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 keep doing it and you just get addicted to the experience. Which, when uh, Mahara Neem Karoli Baba Ramdas gave him acid, he basically came down to to pretty much the same thing. You know, you see Christ, you're able to be with Christ for a couple of hours. It's not true samadhi. You have to come down. Better to become Christ, but it could be useful, and uh, which is the same as you're just going to get addicted to the experience. So some great stuff around. Uh, 
Ramdas's experience with uh, with Mayor Baba. He called uh, somebody called it that the psychedelic trip is has an astral. Maybe this is Mayor Baba astral analogy of reality. How about that? An astral analogy of reality. So, um, but all of it is more dualism. And Ramdas talks about that. And how do you go beyond dualism? How do you transform your own separateness into become merely a statement of the Dharma or a statement of God or a statement of the way things are? And uh, it ends with him. And you know, there's some great stuff around Krishnamurti, everybody, which is uh, really cool. And he ends, a free being is not bound by a plane of consciousness whatsoever. Uh, so it's all about give up clinging. We got to do it. That's it. Here it is. Here's Ram Dass. Uh, and it's just part one. It's, it's great. I mean, this is a big deal. You know, people get, um, as Ramdas said, after a while, after he came back to America from the first time in India, he said it was the it was the power, the miracles that blew him away. And then he realized that was really what was really happening was the unconditional love. Yeah, and that's basically all of our experiences. But today, you know, there's still all these miraculous things going on, particularly with Neem Karoli Baba, uh, with people who are just finding him. And uh, I guess I see, I see the downfall of getting caught. And I remember when it happened to me, I wanted more. You know, there's no ending of, of that. And it just becomes another desire. But... It's still there's a, still a, a a shining light that uh, is needed to break up darkness, which is what a guru does. So I see it as just part of that unconditional love. All right, well that's it. Here you go. Astral fun and games. <laughs> this is Ramdas. I don't even know when this is. They didn't tell me. But we'll see you next week on. Well the. Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com. And there are so many wonderful uh, podcasts that are happening. Uh, check out David Nickturn, by the way. He has this great new book. And he's been doing podcasts. He just won, uh, did one that's out with uh, uh, Rodney Yee and, uh, and his wife. So check that out. And we'll catch you next time. Ramdas, here and now. There is a story about Maharaji in his earlier years, in which he was a uh, he was a wandering sadhu, holy man, and he was in a small village in India. And uh, he was in a barber shop, or by, at a barber's. Barbers usually squat by the side of the road and you just squat down next to them and they shave you and for about two pennies or something like that. And he was being shaved by this barber and the barber was um, spending the whole time, barbers are usually very talkative fellows, and he was spending all the time complaining about the horrible plight because his son had left him some years before and he had lost contact. and. He knew he'd die soon, and he just yearned to see his son. And he was a very, very pure man, the barber. And he kept talking about this and talking about this. And he, was, he had lathered up Maharaji's face. And he had uh, shaved about half of it. And finally, Maharaji just threw off the cover and jumped up and ran down the street. And um, the next day, late in the afternoon, the barber's son arrived. And uh, the barber was overjoyed, and he said, uh, what are you doing here? And the son says, well, I don't really understand what happened. He said, I'm the manager in a hotel now. It's about 200 miles from here. 
And he said, yesterday at around 10 in the morning, which is just when Maharaji was at the barber's, he said, I was standing behind the desk at the hotel and this man ran into the hotel and he was half shaven. He had uh, soap all over one side of his face. And he said, quick, quick, your father needs you. Go home immediately. And he handed me a railway ticket and he ran out again. Now, just take that story for what it is, all right? Um, what's the value of a story like that? What use? Is it just, does it just titillate our fascination with, with the potential powers of human beings? Um, there is a um, very high yogi in India named uh, Sai Baba who uh, manifests uh, things, usually small things. Um, the most uh, frequent thing he manifests is Rabuti or sacred ash. And uh, you can go and see him do it right now. You could go and get on a plane now. And it's, I mean, it's a, there's miracles that are right there available for the skeptic. Um, you can go to India, to Delhi, and then go south and, or Bombay, and then go to uh, Puttaparthi or Whitehall. And um, there, twice a day, usually, there are long lines on one side of the women and on the other side the men. And Sai Baba comes out and he's a radiantly beautiful being. And he starts to walk down the lines and he's wearing a long uh, saffron colored robe with his sleeves, either short sleeves or his sleeves rolled up. And every now and then he looks at somebody and he stops and he motions and the man behind him hands him a little piece of paper maybe usually a piece of torn up newspaper and sticks it on his hand. And Sai Baba goes like this. And right from above his hand, this ash appears out of the Akash, out of the nowhere, and falls on the paper. And he wraps it up and he says, here, take some of this for your dysentery or something like that. And then he walks on. Okay? And now and then he goes like that and a bracelet or a necklace or a some kind of a pendant or something appears. Um, when I was with him, um, I introduced Muktananda to him. I brought, uh, I was the Shutkin arranging that uh, really <laughs> strange marriage. <laughs> um, and that evening, uh, or the evening before, when I was out there arranging it, he invited me to come to the uh, singing of Kirtan, Bhajan Singh. And uh, I sat in the back and he motioned me to come up and sit in front. There was, he sat in a chair and I sat at his feet down here. And he put me through the third degree. I'm sort of fair game for everyone, you know, to sort of show where I'm not. So he asked me what God was. Whatever I answered was wrong, of course. It's one of those impossible questions, which I, I was just the foil for him to give a lecture, really. But afterwards, he rewarded me. As he was leaving, he said, uh, would you like something? And I said, no, Babaji, I don't want anything. I just much joy in just being with you. He says, no, let me give you something. And he was sitting in front of me, and his hand was about where right here in relation to my face, all right? And he started to go like this. And um, I knew he was going to do one of those things, you see, <laughs> which uh, I hadn't uh, yet seen him do, I, sort of from a distance. And I, there's the scientist in me, you know, that said, now I'm not going to blink and I'm not going to be suggestible. And I'm going to watch his other hand and I'm going to stay perfectly conscious because I have to report back. I mean, I have a responsibility here to my, my skeptical colleagues. <laughs> So I watched, but uh, it did it for me because first there was this kind of shimmery blue light that appeared on his hand. And then slowly it solidified and it took form. And it was this uh, little medallion, which was made of um, uh, aluminum, perhaps. It was a circle with a five-pointed star in it on which there was a, a 
gold-plated image of Sai Baba. Right. It was the kind of thing you might buy in Tijuana for about uh, eight cents. And he handed it to me, and it wasn't even warm. I mean, you didn't get a feeling it had just come from another plane or anything. There was, um, there was a humor in the whole thing that here was this incredible power being used to give something that you would look at and throw away generally. I mean, you'd say, isn't that nice? It's the kind of thing you could buy outside the temple at the stands there, and they're made by Indian workmen, you know, and they're really schlock uh, articles. And that's humor. I mean, it's so much more humorous than were he to give you some precious jewel that never appeared on this plane at all ever before, you know. Um, it's really, uh, in, the, he, in the sense, he's showing you that the miracles are a throwaway. And he gives watches to people that say made in Switzerland and stuff like that, right? <laughs> Which feeds everybody's doubt. Like, what is he doing? I mean, is, this, is he just so good a magician that you can't see? And um, when I hung around there, one old Swami said to me, you know, he, he said, uh, he doesn't make those things. I said, oh, no, I, I understand. He says, no, he just moves them with his mind from his warehouse. Uh, oh, I said, is that all he does? You know, it's like, and I had an image of that um, warehouse, you know, with 600 watches and stacks and big bins of rabuti and slowly they're disappearing down and watches are disappearing off the shelves. It must be an extraordinary scene to just, he just takes matter and he dematerializes it, moves it in space and rematerializes it with his mind. And Christ said, had ye but faith, he could move mountains. I mean, so there's nothing to moving, uh, you know, <laughs> a little thing with his image on it. One of my favorite miracle stories is uh, the Nityananda story. I've told it many times, but I love it so much because it's this humor, such humor. I love humor in this game because it tends to be so serious and it's really so funny. Um, Nityananda used to, uh, he was Muktananda's guru. I mean, he had considerable claim to fame independent of being Muktananda's guru, but uh, he was one of the really great, great saints of India. And um, he used to uh, have workmen build roads around uh, to the little villages that had no roads to sort of e increase their economic uh, efficiency and so on. And the workmen were paid about two rupees, maybe. 30 cents, 35 cents a day, which was the going wage. And um, Nityananda would say, at the end of the day, when you finish working, you don't have to come to the paymaster and all. You just go home. And on the way home, any rock you see that you feel like, you pick up that rock and under the rock will be your two rupees. And um, so they'd finish their work and they'd go home and they'd on the way home, they'd lift a rock and there would be their two rupees. And he, you know, you couldn't lift two rocks and get four rupees. It was just one rock, one set of two, one, just two rupees. One two rupee note. Well, the problem was all the rupee notes were brand new notes. And after a while, the uh, police started to get curious about this phenomenon because the rumor was spreading. And um, so the inspector came and... Um, with his a uh, sergeant and he said babaji i'm terribly sorry to bother you but we're a little embarrassed about this but there are all these new rupee notes around and we just don't know where they're being produced and nityananda says oh i understand your predicament perfectly he said uh come i'll show you let me take you to the place where they're being produced so he took the inspector and the sergeant And you've got to understand the, 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 the picture completely, really, just you don't have to, but the fun of it. In India, the bureaucracy, um, what they did, the Indian people did was when the English came in, they came in with this exquisite bureaucracy and the Indians imitated it incredibly. And it, the whole thing is like an imitative game. And they're very, very bureaucratic with great sense of duty about it. Right. And a great sense of purity and righteousness about it. So they were with their notebooks and all ready to collect the data. And he took them off into the jungle 
he's a great big fat fellow lumbering through the jungle. They were following him behind. He went deeper and deeper into the jungle till he came to a, a, a lake. And in southern India, these some of the lakes have um, uh, alligators in them. And this one had alligators. And he walked into the water and he called the alligator. And this big alligator came over. And he took the alligator and he opened his mouth. And he reached in and he started pulling rupee notes out of his throat, you see. And that took care of the inspector and the sergeant who went running off down the path, never to be, never to bother him again. Right? There's this funny level in India, you see, because there's the government and the army, which is doing its thing. Then there are these saints and gurus who uh, are making a shambles of the whole thing. But in a kind of a random and bizarre way. Uh, so that when, for example, um, India was having trouble with China, all the vice presidents and presidents of India ran to their gurus to get covered, right? And uh, it's, it's that level. And yet you never know whether they did it or didn't do it. The whole thing is, mer is uh, covered with dust and confusion and doubt. Are they all charlatans? Is it real? Maharaji had a way of um, doing these gross miracles and then denying it, just outright, blatantly denying it after he'd just done it. Uh, there's a, a big outing like this in which everybody's going to eat lunch afterwards and they've gone miles to get to the place and they forgot to bring the ghee, the clarified butter, to cook the puris in and so on. And everybody's freaked because they've come miles and they can't possibly get back to get it. And Maharaji goes out into the woods to pee and he comes back screaming, raging, yelling, People are so irresponsible. Do you know people left out there tins and tins of ghee just sitting out in the woods? And, you know, he was just <laughs> screaming with indignation. And there's no way you can say to him now, look, Maharaji, you know that ghee isn't out there. <laughs> well, um, what is the value of... Um, all of these astral fun and games. Probably for beings at different stages of evolution, the value is different. That at the stage where you are lost in maya or illusion or the dance of life and there is no awakening in sight, uh, these miracles tend to touch you in a certain way, in the way that the miracles that Christ performed touch the people around them, around him. And they start a process. They start an opening, a faith. Uh, what happens in India, they often become a worship of the person that does the power, which is a complete misconception of what the game is about. But it's in the right direction, especially if the being is a pure being. Right? For uh, people who are more ready to awaken but are caught in their intellects, like most Westerners, the miracles are exquisite because they up-level your intellect because you can't explain it with your mind. It just won't work. There's no rational system for explaining what's been ha what happens in these miracles. And in that sense, it blows your mind or it undercuts it. That's what Maharaji did to me the first time. He just kept, he blew my mind. There was no way he could know what he knew. And it was as if I ran through all my paranoia and there was nowhere to hang it. I couldn't grab. There wasn't any way I could explain how I was being had or conned. And that started to open me in a certain way. What these fit into very nicely is into the path that is called devotional or bhakti yoga. If you appreciate that we are meeting here, as I said before, on the physical plane. And then when you dream, you're on another plane. And there are literally planes and planes and planes of consciousness or lokas, there it means planes, 
of existence. And there are beings on these planes, on many of them. Some there aren't, but most there are. And these planes go and they change in their vibratory rate. They're like television channels. So that when you tune to one, you may not be tuned to another. You may flip from channel to channel. As you get higher on these planes into higher vibratory rates where there's more space and more light, fewer beings exist in these planes. And these beings are much clearer, wiser, higher, less attached. They have less desires that keep pulling them into these other planes. And in the highest plane called the Siddhaloka, in which there are beings, there are beings who are light bodies. They're not in these forms. They're merely lights, if you will. They're light consciousness. And they are really, at that moment, aware of the fact that they're all the same thing. They are all just still separate, but the same. It's that level of, a, of existence on that plane. Yesterday, when we went around the room and said, what have you got? A lot of you said purple, gold. These are all colors atten attached to various planes. Purple plane up in here, for example. When you connect with a plane up through your third eye, you uh, may experience a purple plane. You learn how to go in and out of all of these planes, the colors. Each one has a sound connected with it. You'll hear the sound of flutes, the sound of bells, the sound of uh, rivers rushing, um, a crowd in a railway station, bees buzzing. There are all these different kinds of these just saying what they sound like, of course. There are what are called the masters, Master Mourie and Katumi and set of masters who are beings that live on intermediate planes. They'd be called high astral planes that are in a way involved with this physical plane. That is, there is some commerce across planes. Each of the planes, this plane seems, because of the heaviness of the illusion, this plane seems very horizontal. That is, everybody on this plane seems to be involved with everybody else on this plane, and very rarely are there connections made across these planes. And then, um, every now and then, somebody, um, when they leave their body, when they die, they send messages back and there are a lot of books written by people who've sent messages back telling what it's like on the other planes and there is a certain beauty and poignancy and humor in all of this also because um just because a being is on another plane doesn't mean that they're any higher than you are and what often happens is that these beings send back very well-meaning descriptions of what it's like on the other plane. And it's merely like they went from uh, Rhode Island to Boston, right? And they're sending back long descriptions of Boston. And everybody's assuming out there is Boston, which is it's just another place, right? But they don't know that because just like you don't know it most of the time, right? And uh, they think, well, I went across and I got to the other place, right? Like there was a uh, fellow who was a television uh, medium, Arthur Ford, and he died a few years back and he wrote a book through um, a woman in Washington. I remember what her name was. Huh? Ruth Montgomery. Yeah. He dictated it through. She just sat at the typewriter and he took over her consciousness and dictated the book. And the book describes what his life is like. Right. And obviously what's happened is he's gone to a reasonably low astral plane and he's being trained now for further incarnations and work. And he's, he's in a place where he goes to school, you know, and it's just, it sounds kind of humdrum, you know, but if you, um, if you read the, uh, like Yogananda's book, autobiography of a yogi, that you get a, some very subtle and beautiful descriptions of, uh, some of the planes where, um, the planes are made totally of light and, uh, you create any form you want for your body or anything around you just with thought, which is actually what we're doing, but we don't know we're doing it, so it doesn't pay to talk about it here. But there it's very obvious. 
you can create huge radishes or purple radishes with, you know, with uh, uh, stars pouring out of them and stuff like that. And uh, it's like a total costume party all the time because everybody's creating whatever body they wanted so that if somebody dies and goes to that plane, they may have died at 90 years old and their body was very infirm, but they may take a body on that plane that is like the body they always wanted to have or they had at the prime or whenever they wanted it. And so when you meet beings who have, quote, passed over, you often meet these beings who were you almost don't recognize because you're so busy remembering them like you last saw them. And that just isn't where they're at anymore. Now, um, in terms of your work, and we're, as you recall, we decided that the scenario of this gathering was that you want liberation. You want God, you want to be free. It would be hardly free if you were merely moved from this plane to that plane. You would be just as entrapped in that plane as you are in this plane. And um, that's why you've got to understand the way in which these planes are related to desire systems. For example, if you want power, you will get power. There are planes in which you will have all the powers to create all the miracles. If you are righteous, you will go to places where everybody is righteous. It's called heaven. It's all good. Right? It's not liberation, but it's nice. In fact, any loka or any plane at all that can be defined is just another place. No matter how exquisite it is. Now, this is very, very subtle stuff. Extremely subtle to appreciate this one. Perhaps it can be done a little bit through an understanding of what are called the jhanas in um, Buddhism, in the Tripitaka, which is the Buddhist Pali text. Uh, they describe how as you, uh, your mind gets clearer and stronger and more laser-like, you go into, you can go a path that goes through what are called the eight jhanas, which are like trance states. And these states involve incredible rapture and they involve incredible bliss and they involve incredible beauty. But the last four of them are really far out. They, ex they involve, for example, the feeling of omniscience. They involve the feeling of um, being the one in the entire universe. They involve the feeling of emptiness. But notice the way I'm saying it. They involve the feeling of universality, the feeling of oneness. They are experiences of oneness that is different from the one. If you can understand what I'm talking about. In other words, no matter how high these jhanas get, they are all still in dualism. That is, there is an experiencer and there is that which is experienced. There is a subject-object separation. And many, many very high beings get lost. They experience themselves as being omnipotent and universal. And they conclude that they are enlightened. When actually they have merely entered through a samadhi state into a very high trance. In which they have experienced omniscience and universality. But they are not omniscient or universal necessarily. Okay? They may have great powers. Great, great powers. But it's like the penultimate ego trip, if you can hear it. It's the ultimate expansion of ego. It's not the death of the ego. It's the pushing of the ego out to its outer bounds. And that's all short of what the Arahant goes through or the stream enterers and stream makers and the Buddha and the Tathagata and all the beings who have finished, who have gone beyond self, who have died, if you will. 
into thy will, not my will. And that's a big distinction. That goes beyond dualism at that point. And I think many people have gotten sucked in by that. For example, um, when I used to take LSD all the time, I would experience feelings of uh, great powers, great wisdom. I could know what ha was happening in other places. I could read other people's minds. Um, there were um, moments when I spoke in tongues. There were moments when I spoke poetically. There were all these great powers poured through me. And I could create the universe with my mind any way I wanted it to, to be. I obviously had the power to control other people's minds. But I would always uh, come down from these. And I think that I, what I was trying to do for many years was to not come down from them. So I would have all these powers. That was all ego. I didn't fully understand it. Even though Meher Baba and I had carried on a correspondence back in 1964, in which what had happened was that um, the commune I was living in in Los Altos, California, some of the people there were followers of Meher Baba, and some of them were me and the gal I was with and her baby, and they were uh, all druggies, psychedelic explorers. And Mayor Bob has sent a message back saying, my devotee should have nothing to do with anybody that's using drugs. And that upset us because we were going to have to break up the community. So I wrote a letter to Mayor Baba and I said, Mayor Baba, it's funny to write to God, you know, and I said, dear Mayor Baba, I know you appreciate this, but, um, None of us in America would have ever come to, or most of us in America, would never have come to appreciating your books were it not for psychedelics. And it's a little bit like biting the hand that feeds you. I didn't put it quite that way, but like I came to love you and honor you through psychedelics and uh, could it all be bad if, if in the sense I only understand your words through these. And I got a telegram immediately. I know you're a true lover. Don't worry, be happy. <laughs> And a letter will follow, and a letter followed, and the letter said, um, uh, a few serious seekers like you can use this medicine. You may take it three more times, and then you should stop. But uh, other people shouldn't use it, and uh, it will drive them insane. And it is no more like the true reality than a mirage is like water. And to continue to use it will drive you insane because you will get addicted to the experience. Now, at the time, I was very emotionally involved in using LSD, and I didn't want to hear this at all. And the Mayor Baba people watched to see what I would do, and we all counted off one, two, three. And then came the Berkeley Conference on LSD in 1966, I guess. Um... And uh, I made a point of taking LSD for the fourth time just before that conference. And uh, that led the Mayor Baba people to pick at the conference. And it was a whole melodrama that unfolded. And then Mayor Baba said terrible things about me. And I said terrible things about Mayor Baba. And I still loved him. But uh, it was, that was why it was funny when I got to Maharaji. And the first thing he said is, Mayor Baba is your guru. You know, that was like... Uh, <laughs> So after um, Maharaji took LSD for the second time in 1970, and this time he had taken uh, 1,200 micrograms, and I watched him put them in his mouth so I knew that he had taken them, which I had doubted from the time before, and nothing happened to him. He then said, this is yogi medicine. He said it was known about long ago in the Kulu Valley by yogis, but it's all been forgotten now. He said it's useful, that it would allow you to come in and be in the presence of Christ. You could have his darshan, pranam to him. You could even stay for two hours, but then you'd have to leave again. Say it's not the true samadhi. But he said, he said it would be better to become Christ than to just visit with him. But LSD won't do that for you. This yogi medicine won't do that for you. 
He said, but if you're in a cool place and you're feeling much peace and your mind is turned totally towards God, it could be useful. But it's not the true samadhi. See, because even visit, visiting a saint is useful, he said, as we sat at his feet. Now I was ready to hear what he was saying, what Mehababa had said also. That what these chemicals were doing were taking me into the jhanas or into astral analogs of reality, but they weren't the thing itself. They were still the experience of it, the separation, the one level away. They were still in dualism. I had not transcended dualism yet. I had not become it. And that's why I kept coming down from it, because I wasn't in it. And it's roughly the same issue with all of this, the astral goodies. They are all ultimately more dualism. However, since you are beings who seek liberation, and therefore you must seek to go beyond dualism, the question is, in view of your karmic predicament, how do you get beyond dualism? That is, how do you kill yourself? without killing yourself? How do you transform your own separateness into becoming merely a statement of the Dharma or a statement of God? How do you do that? Now, the most extreme method of doing that is reflected in people like Krishnamurti or Zen Buddhism or the Song of Mahamudra, the Vow of Mahamudra which says, in effect, you already are the Buddha nature. Stop screwing around. Just be who you are. Don't use methods. Don't get caught in dualism. Don't do anything. Just be. Be, be free. Forget it. Stop thinking you're somebody and just be it. That's known as the steep path with no guardrail. Because in that sense, you just go in and you sit down in the Zen, the Zenery, <laughs> The Zen, uh, Zendo, thank you. You go and you sit down in the Zendo and you just sit. And then you say, well, what do I do? Well, that's a Western thought. What do I do? Just sit. They don't even tell you to follow your breath. That's already schlock Zen. See, I mean, that's already sneaking in Southern Buddhism. See, I mean, the real Zen purists just sit. Should I close my eyes? Just sit. Well, what do I think about? Just sit. You are the Buddha. You're enlightened. What, what's all the production about? Just sit. Just be. Be who you are. And you, you scream because you got to struggle with, well, what do I do? Well, see, I mean, like, we're giving you things to do. I mean, every second you got something to do. This is very different from a Zen Sashin. Even the, the koans are not pure in that sense of that form of Zen. They are the weaker form, if you will, because they're using the mind to beat the mind, which is yana yoga. That's not the ultimate. Take it. By all means, take it. Don't get screwed up with gurus, with meditation practices, with singing to nonsensical beings, with... Uh, moving your body and standing on your head. What a bunch of nonsense. I mean, why get lost in all that junk? Why don't you just become enlightened? Okay. I mean, I'm giving you the straight, clean, Krishnamurti Zen line now. Okay. Of course, Krishnamurti is very funny. We'll talk about it later, but because of his history, I'll save that for later. It's such fun. Well, no, because it fits in here. Krishnamurti was a young boy, an Indian boy, who um, was picked up off the street by um, is it Annie Besant or Madame Blavatsky. I guess it was Annie Besant. Annie Besant and um, Colonel um, huh? Alcott. Colonel Alcott. They were the heads of the Theosophical Society, and they were looking to found a new religion, and they needed a new world leader. 
And there was this beautiful young boy who had obviously very high astral stuff. And they could see they had third eyes were open. And they saw he was a very high being. And they said, this is the one. And they took him and they groomed him and they trained him. And he became the head of the Order of the Star, I guess it was called. And there were at one time 70,000 members of it. And he wrote beautiful things and he had great visions and he went into trances and he used to sit under trees and go into samadhi and all of the stuff just the way that's supposed, that trip is supposed to go down. And then around in his 20s, he repudiated the whole thing. He disbanded the order, said the whole thing's a hype. It's just a trap. It's keeping you from God. I won't be a party to this absurdity. And uh, he stayed very close to the theosophists, some of them, in which there was a lot of infighting. But he then went off to become a very great statement of don't use any methods because they're all traps. However, his method or his way of becoming to where he got to involved all those experiences. So there is a little bit of peculiarity in his telling everybody else not to do it when he himself came through it. It's like me saying to you, don't use drugs. I can't in true conscience say that to you because I am very beholding to psychedelics for the way in which they change my consciousness. And I'm not about to knock them, no matter who tells me how moral I'm supposed to be about it. Right? Okay. Well, for most of you, my telling you you are Buddha and there's no reason to do any methods didn't enlighten you immediately. If it did, you're being very cool about it. <laughs> That's all energy. All free energy. See, if you take it and don't get caught in the symbolic nature of it, just take it as energy and feed it up your spine, get incredibly high on it. Thank you. <laughs> Since most of us can't go the steepest path, because of the clingings of our heart or our mind. We start to use a stepladder. And the stepladder involves all the practices we do. And the stepladder can involve all these planes of consciousness. That is, you can use one plane in order to liberate you from another plane. Just in the same way, if you grew up as I did, going through psychology graduate school so that your instruments of individual differences were the Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory and the California personality inventory and the Rorschach inkblot test and the etc. the Leary interpersonal checklist and so on. If that was your mosaic of individual differences and then you meet a good astrologer, you suddenly get a whole new fix of individual differences that up levels the game you were stuck in in terms of individual differences in personality. Do you understand that? That's just a, like another plane of reality of individual differences still. And you say, oh, well, that, all of her body symptoms and all of her personality is explained by the fact that she's a Taurus and her moon is in the ascendant on the 12th house under on Thursday or whatever, however that's done. Right? And actually, the higher up you get on the game, the better your predictive power. So a, a good astrologer, which is what they have in India, which is somebody who is an astrologer coming out of a higher plane rather than way, the way we do it. We read a book on astrology and climb up and grab at a few individual difference matrices and then become professionals. But there are beings who are wise men and women who are then astrologers. They merely come down into form as astrologer. And their, their astrological insights of individual differences are exquisitely high in terms. I mean, they beat the predictability of any science we have, any social science we have in the West. Uh, but I'm talking about the wise men astrologers, not the book learning astrologers. Okay. These are astrologers who use both the birth and the conception sign and the sun sign. They use all the signs all at once rather than any one of them. So that you can use another plane because if you start to, if you sit down and meditate and suddenly you come up and you experience yourself 
as this um, this old yogini sitting in a mountain cave and you feel the re reality of that and then you come back into this plane the sense of another identity in you changes the meaning of this identity it loosens the hold of it a little bit and the game is that you use these other planes to loosen the hold of the physical plane the problem is the difficulty or the delicacy of it is that most of these planes have more energy connected with them, more Shakti, more power, more light, more intensity than this plane does. And they are very seductive, and you'd rather stay there than here, unless they are very ugly planes, hell locas. And when somebody stays on one of those planes and then doesn't come back to this plane, in this culture, we call them psychotic. In other cultures, they treat them differently. For example, Meher Baba spent much time going around India taking care of what are called the musts. musts. These are God intoxicants. They're beings who have gone into other planes and they aren't back here. And we would hospitalize them. But in India, many of them are treated as great saints because when you're around them, you can feel the incredible light force and energy and they are seeing often much more clearly than we're seeing, but they aren't able to keep it together on this plane. And they can't eat and they can't wash themselves and Meher Baba would take care of them. He'd wash them and feed them and so on. Now, all people that are stuck on other planes aren't necessarily high saints because you've got to understand what sticks you on these planes. What sticks you are your attachments, your clingings, your desires. So if you want power, you could go to a plane in which there's great power and you'd want to stick there because you are very, very power hungry. That doesn't make you necessarily very spiritual. But there are beings that go to other planes and because the plane is closer to God, they're just pulled towards God. The pull is incredible and they don't want to come back. A good guide in the work of inner planes, whatever plane you'll get to, just like I was telling you in the meditations yesterday, Go in the day before, whatever you get into, notice it, acknowledge it, allow it, don't judge it, don't push it away, then take another breath and go on. In other words, don't cling to whatever plane of reality you're in, including this one. Because a free being is not bound by any plane of reality whatsoever, none whatsoever. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.